Well, thank you to the stalwart parties that stuck around. I've, this is actually a golden moment for me because I always, I always followed uh, Steve Martin's uh, request for uh, when he does speaking events, he insists that it's after five, the room is dark, and everybody's been drinking. <laughs> and for once, everybody's drinking. So if I do tell a joke, though it's not likely, you might laugh at it. So uh, a little bit more background on me, right? So I'm a uh, industry analyst, have been since 2000, with a few timeouts to spend time at uh, both Webroot Software and Fortinet. And telling the story, but I need the slides. Got to have the slides. So as an industry analyst, right, I am covering the space, but also looking at the drivers in my space. And in any other space other than security, the drivers are customer demands, changing economies, globalization, etc. But in security, the drivers are threat actors. So I spend half my time looking at the threat actors, half my time looking at the technologies to address those. And in 2010, or really 2008, finally, you know, information warfare became a thing because we had Russia essentially attacking Estonia, and then shortly after that attacking Georgia, and things that I thought qualified as cyber warfare. So I wrote a book, the, really the history, short history of uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks called Surviving Cyber War, published by an academic press who signed me up for three books. So they wanted me to write the book on cyber war, cyber defense, and cyber crime. So I started writing the cyber defense book as soon as the first one was published. And I'm sitting there writing the book that was always in my head, which was probably the proper title would have been uh, Enterprise IT Security. Uh, and I'm merrily going along there. So I'm, today I'm going to tell you the, the results of some of the research that went into that book and why I had to stop writing the book, because I was way, way off base and I had everything wrong. What's changed over the last five years is targeting and defending against targeted attacks. In targeting, it just changes your thought process. It changes the tools, techniques, and procedures you need to defend yourself against targeted attacks. Um, it changes your investment, changes the skill sets you hire, and uh, changes your internal processes. In a targeted attack, the adversary has already predetermined what they want. Right? So they need the designs for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. They need your store of credit card information. They need uh, your processes or the documents if you're a law firm that are, you know, your planning documents for pursuing a law case. Um, so they know what they want. They do the research to figure out where it is. They know who in your organization is most likely to have it. So they're going to target those people. Uh, and they don't stop, ever. They have a mission, and they are going to get it. So unlike a virus, you know, which just spreads on its own, or a worm, remember those days with worms that just spread on their own, or the kind of hacktivist, you know, target of opportunity thing where they're attacking you only because you're vulnerable, uh, this is totally different, and you have to change your mindset completely. So always good to think back on some examples. Um, and we talk about the time to detect uh, that are reported, you know, in the, uh, the uh, Verizon business or, uh, uh, breach report, etc. Uh, I think one of the greatest examples is the breach of Nortel. Imagine being in charge of a technology company, one of the largest in the world, that is totally owned by adversary hackers for a period of 10 years. They're reading all the emails that the executives send and receive and seeing all the documents that those executives see for 10 years. It, you might question your ability to survive in a competitive global environment if your adversaries and competitors had all of that information. And so I'm not actually claiming that Nortel doesn't exist because of this hack, uh, but it is the case that they were completely compromised by Chinese hackers for 10 years. Now, the book that I'm not going to talk about is the book that I'm signing today, but it involves the attacks against uh, our weapon systems, uh, mostly in the United States. But uh, my friend Ellen, Ellen Nakashima at the Washington Post reported that in one confidentially leaked report, um, more than 10 US weapon systems have been targeted and successfully breached. The data from them, or the design data from them, 
uh, had been exfiltrated, including things like the Advanced Patriot Missile System, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, THAAD, uh, the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, FAA-18 Hornet, and of course, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which features prominently in my book. Financial services, not immune. Now we now know that JP Morgan spent $250 million a year on, uh, on IT security. Huge, huge spending budget. Um, half the employees of JP, JP Morgan Chase are IT people. Uh, there's no question that banks are now actually IT organizations, um, and yet they still got breached. And we didn't even know this until the, the day before um, uh, Black Hat uh, two years ago, when you know this researcher in Chicago just kind of issues a press release. Most of us poo-pooed it. This is crazy. The guy's just trying to get attention right before Black Hat. But he claimed he had found a, a reservoir of a billion identities uh, that had been stolen. And looking deeper into it, sure enough, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase determined that 70 million of those actually belonged to their customers. And they dove deep and discovered that it was a credential-based attack. Somebody had stolen a digital certificate from an internal meeting website and used that to promulgate uh, throughout their network and eventually exfiltrate all of these identities. And of course, you can't talk about uh, targeted attacks without talking about Stuxnet. Um, it's worth talking about in every single presentation and every single meeting that you have. Uh, the reason is, for, you know, for multiple reasons, Stuxnet is still today unique. Stuxnet, of course, burned through four zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, it was persistent. It uh, deployed a, a very, very uh, clever DLL rootkit inside Windows machines. Um, once that rootkit was installed, anybody who was using uh, Siemens Step 7 software to talk to the particular controller that controlled uh, nuclear um, uh, uranium uh, centrifuges in the tons, then they would take effect and damage and sabotage occurred. The important thing that I want to stress here, and you'll see right towards the end here, is that this was an autonomous attack. This was not an APT. This was set in action. Of course, there's tons and tons of reconnaissance, tons and tons of research went into it. Estimates, you know, in the 10 to $20 million uh, total investment required to execute Stuxnet. But once they pushed the button and said, go and launch it, it did its job. It was done. So keep that in mind as, as we talk, because this is not APT, which is always a command and control situation. So we've been a little bit worried about the so-called cyber Pearl Harbor that could occur. I make a big point that, you know, when, when uh, Liam Panetta talks about cyber Pearl Harbor, you know, he's really getting his metaphors wrong, right? Cyber Pearl Harbor was a military defeat through surprise, or, or Pearl Harbor was a military defeat through surprise. Um, but what he's really talking about is a cyber 9-11, right? An attack on our critical infrastructure. So no matter how it's going to happen, when it does happen, uh, it'll be debilitating. It doesn't serve any purpose other than to make some sort of point, whoever the attacker may end up being, um, because the likelihood of, you know, the real military purpose of this type of attack against critical infrastructure would be to soften up the target before you physically attack them. That doesn't seem likely even in today's uh, scary world that we're in. But there will be attacks on critical infrastructure. Everybody agrees that it's ridiculously easy to do so because they're unprotected. If Jeff Moss were still here, I'd point out to him that there is an entire industry that also uh, benefits from lack of liability, and that's the public utility systems in the United States. They have no liability for not doing their job of delivering power. So if somebody dies in a hospital because the power wasn't delivered, it's not the public utility's responsibility, and you can't sue them either. But two years ago, we started discovering uh, versions of black energy completely uh, infiltrating most uh, power generation systems throughout the United States. Black energy targets a vulnerability in uh, GE Simplicity uh, and a couple other systems, including Siemens once again. Uh, once it's in, it grants power to uh, the outside user. 
to basically take control of control systems. So you just do a quick Google search, image search of Siemens WinCC, and you get this wonderful screenshot. Here it just happens to be a turbine system, so a power generation system. And this is what somebody using this control system actually sees. And you'll notice down here there's an up and down arrow on the boxes marked RPM. If somebody had used black energy to get access to this system, uh, they would just click up and down until they, they got the turbine spinning at its resonance fre resonant frequency and it would blow up wherever it was. Black energy is, is closely tied forensically to the sandworm uh, worm that was used by Russian hackers to infiltrate NATO organizations. So it's, it's a pretty good idea that all black energy attacks are closely related to Russian hackers. Black energy is the, uh, the, uh, r basically the, the uh, RAT, uh, remote access trojan, that was deployed in Ukraine to shut down uh, one of their power grids. <laughs> Uh, over Christmas this past year, plus their airport was shut down uh, a couple weeks afterwards. So we've, we've already had demonstrations of targeted attacks against critical control systems that have been damaging and shut them down, including uh, the summer before in Germany where a, uh, a steel furnace was actually destroyed through an attack using control systems. So, so we're done, we've had it, we've had all the warning we need, everybody has to drop everything, go back and fix all their systems. Of course, it's not happening, right? You talk to a public utility or an oil and gas uh, uh, transport company today and they'll go, eh, that was Ukraine. That doesn't have anything to do with us. Um, that will continue to happen until it happens here in the United States. But now we come to the, the example that stopped me from writing the book on cyber defense. So I was 50,000 words into this great book I was writing, and I realized, oh, you know, if you're gonna write a, a you know, narrative nonfiction book, you need a really good first chapter, so I need a really good targeted attack to talk about. So I'm gonna go talk to RSA and learn their story. So I go in and interview uh, Dave Martin, who was the uh, CSO of uh, EMC during all this. The poor guy, you know, it was only a year and a half uh, since the event when I was interviewing him, and the poor guy looked like, you know, he must have aged 15 years in a year and a half. It was a very, very stressful situation. But a persistent, relentless drive to capture the Secure ID tokens that were used to seed um, the, the Secure ID tokens. So attacks against RSA Secure ID are, are well documented. So it's, it's been one of the most fun things for academics to talk about. Um, and up till that point, it all revol resolved to, you know, we have to have the secure seed or we can't break this system. Uh, you can get the secure seed by putting one of these devices in a microwave oven and wiring it in such a way that it'll, it'll give it up, right? But you destroy it. So it's probably, uh, and if you already have it, you know, why do you have to extract the seed from it? This is one of the examples I use to, to criticize people who say, step one in a risk management program is identify all of your critical assets. You don't know which of your assets are critical to the attacker. So it could be, you know, yes, it's gonna be your financials, that's easy, but it could be one of your products. And you might not actually, you know, sit down in a room, you might forget that, hey, you guys, that spreadsheet with 30 million secure seeds in it is actually a critical asset and we should do everything in the world to protect it. And you know, frankly, RSA should have had it on a separate server with two-person uh, access to it, authenticated with two-factor authentication themselves. They didn't, it was just <laughs> sitting there for somebody to take. So they watched the hackers take it. it was, and it was a phenomenal attack and the story is phenomenal. They were, they had three days as they watched the attackers in their network from discovery to, oh my God, that file going out the, the window is actually a very critical file and somebody actually hit, hit the big red button in the knock that shut off all internet access for all of EMC. Um, that guy was risking his job when he did that and he made the right choice. Now interestingly, when RSA announced the, uh, the leak of these things, they said, at this time, we are confident that the information extracted does not enable a successful direct attack on any RSA Secure ID customers. Um, that's not on their website anymore, but luckily the SEC still has a copy of it. That's all and all good, except that two months later, Lockheed Martin saw an attack 
coming in with a spoofed Secure ID token. They saw that and they hit their big red button and they shut down remote access for 80,000 employees. And I knew that when I was going into RSA, but I said, well, wait a minute. How in the world could you detect an inappropriate authenticated access using an RSA Secure ID token? So I went to talk to Lockheed. And that's when I threw up my hands in the air and said, boy, I really don't understand this. I'm thinking I'm getting to understand it by now. So we're going to talk about cyber defense, the art of cyber defense. Um, and it starts with tracking attacks by campaign. You have to be able to extract key indicators of compromise and key indicators of attack from data that you have internally and externally. Uh, you have to do full packet capture and monitoring. You have to do threat actor research, objective pen testing, and you need organizational change. When I saw campaign tracking, I'd never ever been exposed to this before. And I'm sitting as I have a hundred, 200 times, I'm <laughs> sitting hearing somebody talk about their security programs and they throw up on the screen something that looked a lot like this. They had a bunch of campaigns. Cheesy Fingers was actually one of them. Um, they just picked names, you know, randomly, just like uh, military code words probably. And then they tracked by month what the campaign has done and where, where it's gone. The idea of a campaign, so if, you know, typically a campaign will start, and, and in many cases Lockheed will say it's the, and as did RSA, you know, it's the B team who's doing the reconnaissance and trying out the first few things, because why invest a lot if somebody's got some real obvious vulnerabilities or they've got a lot of employees that just love to click on links that you send them in emails. Um, so they track a campaign in the very first phase, sure enough, you know, it'll be a broadcast phishing email to a lot of employees using uh, known exploits against known vulnerabilities, um, though probably packed in a way that your antivirus and your IPS isn't gonna catch it. Uh, if, if you recognize it and catch it because you're doing sandboxing, as you should be, uh, and you block it, the next time it comes in, it's going to be using you know, similar methodologies, but it'll be targeted against key individuals, the ones that they are after. As in RSA, right? So the, the attack against RSA started with a, uh, a third party, so a accounting firm, uh, and there's a lot of back and forth on a benefits package. There was an email chain that had 20 participants in it, and there was a spreadsheet that they were discussing that went back and forth. The attackers in RSA's case sent from spoofed uh, IP addresses from the supplier to four of the individuals on that email chain a updated uh, spreadsheet. And they got one person to open it. Three guys were too smart to open it because they said, hey, how come everybody's not on this, this email distribution? At Lockheed, they'll see that and track it until, of course, they miss it, right? And then the attackers get to the next stage and they're hoping that the next layer of defense they have catches them. They show a campaign tracking chart to upper management once a week. And that's when I realized the answer to the question I get every single time I speak, which is, you know, when I talk to IT people, they say, yeah, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir. How do we better articulate the problems, the, you know, the, generate fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the board or the executive level? And, you know, my, my answer is always, well, just bring me in. I'll scare the whatever out of them. Um, but this is the answer. So everybody likes to think that, that CEOs and boards of directors make decisions based on you know, risk management principles. They carefully weigh the return on investment here and there. And yet, you, know, you see HP buying autonomy with a due diligence process that lasted a couple of weeks. And he spent, I don't know, $11 billion on a company that had, frankly, fraudulent practices and wasn't worth that at all. The, everybody shoots from the hip, especially high-flying CEOs of companies. Um, they, they're motivated by fear and greed, right? So, oh my God, somebody's buying this, we're gonna go in there and buy it for more. Uh, oh my God, somebody's moving into South America, we have to move into South America. So it's all nice and good to have the risk management and the numbers backing up decision-making processes, but you still, can feed off of this fear and greed. And you do that with this campaign tracking. You demonstrate, you get to the point where you can demonstrate that named attackers that have a fingerprint 
of how they act, and you, ultimately, hopefully, you can figure out what they're after. Uh, you show that to upper management, and they will get the answer that Lockheed Martin does regularly. Do you need more resources? How can we help? Do you have enough money? Are there more tools that you need to purchase? Just imagine being a CISO and getting questions like that instead of, what's the ROI for security on this? So Lockheed, of course, has, is famous for introducing us to the idea of the cyber kill chain. Perhaps not the best metaphor, right? Because the, the kill chain is actually a, a targeting uh, for artillery process. Um, but they've deployed it in such a way and they re-architected it so we can understand it. And this is for APTs, right? So this is for when a targeted attacker decides that you've got the stuff they want and this is the process they're gonna use. Uh, they engage in reconnaissance. It's very, very difficult to detect. Uh, there's some deception vendors that are figuring out ways to detect reconnaissance going on. It's very cool stuff. Uh, once they've uh, done the reconnaissance, they know your IT assets, they might know your security uh, assets, they know your people, then they weaponize the malware, they you know, use uh, off-the-shelf components or design their own in order to deliver it into you and then exploit it, detonate it, install. Uh, there's always the command and control channel, which makes it very easy to detect, right? Uh, communication generated on the inside uh, going to the outside, especially if it's going all the way to China, is something that you should know about and should stop. The reason, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, so we all know FireEye, right? FireEye failed over and over and over to get any traction until they added one little tiny feature, which was beaconing detection. And after they added beaconing detection to their product, they could deploy it in any company in a proof of concept and say, whoa, you've got a problem, because they would always find the installed botnet inside the organization. And you should be looking for that. That's one of your key indicators. At RSA, uh, Dave Martin said the one thing that he wished he had was more packet capture. He only had about 80% of what he needed to rebuild and do the forensics as fast as he could. Uh, but you have to be looking at all your traffic all the time. And I think Jeff Moss was saying you have to record it all the time. You have to be extracting that uh, information, fingerprinting traffic, generating alerts when you see the abnormal behavior, uh, and then you retain it. Because later on, you're gonna have more information about what an attack might look like. Maybe uh, a competitor in, in, in one of the information sharing organizations, ISILs that you belong to, has said, hey, we saw something funny, here's an MD5 hash of what it is. You can go back and replay your old network traffic against the new information and determine if Maybe you were under attack six months ago. What happened to that attack? That campaign, did it succeed? One of the newer uh, areas in the defense side of things that I see is threat intelligence. And I started looking at this last August. It's growing at, eight, the business is growing at 84% uh, annually. Uh, it includes a whole swath of different vendors that are providing feeds. They're extracting indicators of compromise from malware sources. Um, they might be delivering that in the form of PDFs or emails or through the new Sticks platforms. They are uh, infiltrating hacker organizations um, from cyber criminals to anonymous and in some cases actually terrorist organizations. So they're kind of stepping on the toes of uh, government counterterrorism activities. Uh, and they're just flooding you with this information. Uh, and of course, you know, this definitely is not something that you should be consuming unless you've done a lot of your housekeeping well before that. But if you're targeted and you're getting into building a SOC, or as Lockheed calls it, a security uh, intelligence center, a SIC, uh, you'll be needing these things. And you filter them all through a threat intelligence platform. Because just like SIM and logs and all the rest, we've got a, a data problem. There's too much of this out there. And of course, a lot of them are reporting the exact same things. So you want to deduplicate all that incoming data, make sense out of it. And then the hard part is feed that out to your other security tools. And you know, there's going to be a little battle in the environment for uh, SIM versus TIPS because the SIM vendors you know, have struggled for over a decade to actually add value, right? So other than for their compliance purposes, and yep, we log everything, here it is. The SIM vendors also would like to say, you know, out of those million alerts that we generated today, this one is something that you actually should drop everything and pay attention to. 
The threat actor research vendors um, are, are quite interesting. You start talking to them and you realize that they are doing very, very spooky, scary stuff. So you know, usually fairly young people uh, infiltrating uh, the chat channels and communities of very, very nasty people. They have to have perfect OPSEC or, you know, the best case, they get kicked, booted out of uh, whatever channel they're on. Worst case is they start getting death threats and, and could, could suffer physical da uh, danger. Um, but these threat actor research vendors are monitoring these IRC channels, Pastebin, Twitter, et cetera, but they go all the way into the so-called deep dark web. Um, there's one vendor in, uh, in Amsterdam that tracks 10 million uh, hacker handles. Um, so when you're later on doing your, your, your threat hunting and you find a hacker handle, boom, you can get all the activity and kind of know if, uh, if it's a Carter attacking you, if it's a terrorist attacking you, et cetera. <coughs> and, you know, there's some talk this morning and, and, uh, uh, about de the deception space. So, yeah, you know, Honeypots had a early uh, version of them, which was basically, here, throw this Linux version system and, you know, you, on its own hardware, on your network, make it wide open and vulnerable and maybe seed it with some fake documents and you'll attract, just like bees to honey or flies to honey, you'll attract attackers. Bad idea. Right? You don't want to make, do anything that makes you seem more attractive to a hacker. You never want to do that. And even if you did back in those days, then all your IT security staff would be playing around in the honeypot because that's fun stuff compared to doing more patching and vulnerability remediation. But today, the deception vendors uh, are much more savvy. And it actually addresses an issue that I saw when I was talking to Lockheed. So Lockheed wouldn't reveal the exact number, but Lockheed was a, a member of the very, very first equivalent of an ISAC, the Defense Industrial Base, the DIB. And they were sharing information, right? So they would actually get together and have these secure forums and they would share indicators of compromise, all good. Lockheed said that of the attacks that they were tracking, the campaigns they were tracking, only 20% of the actual things that they caught were informed by data that they got from the DIB. In other words, no matter how much threat intelligence you consume, you've still got an 80% problem inside. Deception helps address that because the deception vendors kind of follow this historical perceptive. You know, if you're in battle with somebody, uh, fooling the adversary is a good idea. And, you know, just like all of the, you know, fake silhouetted uh, airplanes and even ships that we've seen in satellite photos, uh, deception vendors will deploy very, very quickly, you know, many, many micro VMs in order to fool the attacker. So one, you know, just basic defense you get out of that is the attacker now has a bigger surface area that they have to go after. If they ever touch one of these virtual instances, then they immediately set off all the alarms, right? Because only an attacker would see those. Or an insider, you know, so it does catch insider uh, activity uh, as well. But you also have uh, data deception. So now you seed uh, all of your servers with fake folders and files. There's systems out there that can actually generate a complete uh, uh, folder system uh, that based on what industry sector you're in that would look realistic and attractive to an attacker. If they grab those files and exfiltrate them and then open them up while they're still connected to the internet, those files beacon back home to say, whoop, you know, an attacker got in, exfiltrated data, and opened it on this server in Russia or China. Um, the other thing they do is they, they plant deceptive identities in memory. So, you know, the classic uh, uh, lateral movement in an APT attack is to use some of those credentials that are still in memory, the pass the hash attack, several others, and if they're false and uh, identities cached there and they're used, that immediately tells you that, hey, that particular endpoint has been compromised. So very, very cool stuff. It's in the early, early days for deception, but I think it's going to address this uh, uh, identity of gathering threat intelligence of attackers on your network. Uh, one other thing that, that I discovered working with a uh, big bank, in, the biggest bank in Australia, is they were working on creating a, a different philosophy of pen testing. So instead of the stuff that I used to do when I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers, which was kind of, 
you know, just find a bunch of vulnerabilities, especially ones that are exploitable. At, at PwC, we rarely uh, uh, executed ex uh, against exploits. Um, but if I went in and had a 70-slide presentation and all their vulnerabilities, I, one, I could bore them to tears with all the places they were vulnerable, um, but two, I could justify my horrendous fees for doing that. That doesn't work quite so well anymore, right? Everybody's got vulnerability management. They're all doing that. You're not going to find the vulnerabilities. Um, it'll be a little bit like Dell Computer. So I was called in to do an attack and penetration test on Dell. So, so long ago that I think it's okay to talk about. Um, at, at the time, in the late 90s, Dell was one of these vaunted companies that was doing $20 million a month of e-commerce. Um, so, you know, everybody talked about it. All the news articles were about it. And Dell was selling PCs over the internet with e-commerce. We just hammered their internet connection. Could not find a single vulnerability. And the reason was they had a checkpoint firewall in front of uh, big, huge uh, Cisco routers that had ACLs that were limited to port 80. You know, we didn't have port uh, uh, 440 back then, uh, 441. So, um, so all you could see was port 80, and then after that all you could see was a web server, and we couldn't find any vulnerabilities in the web server. So it was like locked down. So then we do the internal assessment, um, and we see all the ACLs in there, which were, you know, one ACL, block everything except port 80, and about 40 lines just allow Michael Dell to get in from his laptop from home. So I went back and we're, you know, we're scratching our heads because no way does an auditor want to give somebody a clean bill of health. So I, I used uh, AltaVista because Google wasn't around yet. And I AltaVistaed um, a Dell Premier Customer Password. And I found four universities in the United States who on their websites, because universities, of course, didn't have firewalls back then, on their websites, they exposed how to purchase your new Dell computer when you became a staff member. And they, you know, in clear text, had the username and password for logging in. So it took me about 45 minutes to get to the point where I could order computers shipped to my home on somebody else's POs. So I went to the security team. I said, ha, we got you. Uh, you know, I got to steal computers from you. And they said, ah, that's not security. You know, that's... You know, something that I call business process hacking. But this bank did a cool thing. So instead of doing these, this pen test, they said, okay, set an objective and achieve it. So one of the objectives one day was, let's see if we can uh, hack the SWIFT wire transfer system in order to put money in our bank account at this bank. Took them a day. These kids, you know, smart, smart kids, but had never, you know, come across IBM, what was it, MVS, I think was the job control language. Um, but they quickly figured out that Swift ran on this old IBM protocol. Uh, and so they just went online, got the documents for the protocol, which were never meant to be online, right? They're always printed in ring binders in the data center. Uh, quickly figured out the entire protocol, realized that the, a Swift wire transfer terminal uh, uses client-side authentication. So basically the big mainframe in the sky trusts the terminal to attest to its own identity. So it didn't take it very long to, to figure out how to send commands to the, uh, the big mainframe in the cloud and transfer a million dollars into their account. So all of a sudden they had a million dollars sitting in their account uh, with very, very little effort. Now, mind you, you know, it's financial systems, so there's checks and balances, and there's a nightly uh, uh, balancing of books. So a million dollars would have been caught uh, that night, but, it, you know, a wily hacker would just figure out a way to get a million dollars out of his bank as fast as possible. And the final task is creating what I call the cyber defense team. If that's too military sounding, you know, call it whatever you like. Uh, but it is a separation of duties and a separation of personnel and skills from the classic antivirus and configuration management and your identity and access management people. Um, uh, I propose that it includes these three elements, the analysts, the operations team, but they're operating, you know, the newfangled stuff, right? The sandboxes, the deception processes, the hunting processes, uh, the security analytics processes. So they're specialists in tracking down the guys who've got the bad guys who've gotten through, and then a red team to do this objective-based penetration testing, uh, and hopefully a cyber commander who probably isn't like a CISO. CISOs are uh, very well versed in business language, talking to the CFO, etc. 
This person is going to be losing a lot of hair and a lot of sleep worrying about attackers on your organization. And even after you accomplish that, I remind you that it's going to get much, much worse. Therefore, you have to do everything I'm talking about, and you have to do it extremely quickly because we have limited time before the attacks become automated. We're going to have autonomous Stuxnet-like attacks that get in, get what they want, and exfiltrate it at, in machine time and not in human time. You're not going to be able to see you know, the, the nine to five Beijing time attack cycles that we see today. Um, and you know what? I don't know how we're gonna address that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, questions, anybody? What do you see as a um, strategy to deal with this mess? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> Um, so, this, you know, the strategy is, um, well, first of all, like Simon, I am a cyber optimist. I am confident that the uh, technology and the industry will, will respond to all threats, right? So, now, mind you, there will be some disastrous attacks, and we'll continue to have the breaches. Um, but an organization like Lockheed Martin, I think, has paved the way, shown the way, uh, it is possible to ward off all attackers. Um, so the strategy is to you know, uh, step back, look at what the norm is in highly targeted industries, and assume that that norm is, is pushing down, right? So today, everybody below Lockheed Martin is kind of wide open, right? And, and they just haven't seen the attacks. So first, look for them, find them, and then start investing. Unfortunately, the strategy, to, the strategy to date has been we haven't suffered any damaging attack that we know of, so we must be investing appropriately, and let's just keep going the way we're going. I've got this concept of a cybersecurity deficit, um, and basically and it started uh, 10, 15 years ago when we started to get online, and organizations like the military, which is the topic of my book, starting in 1995, um, when the military moved to a network-centric warfare uh, setting, but banks uh, and manufacturers and, you know, 99% <clears throat> of all organizations are turning into some sort of digital organization. We jumped on the band bandwagon and we only invested in getting there and reaping the benefits, right? So banks immediately started to reap the benefits. They didn't need as many tellers. Um, they had better outreach. They could go global or at least national faster. Uh, with just being online. Um, but they underinvested in security. And it's only because the attackers are laggards as well. So the attackers are, are catching up, right? Because first we had hacktivists figuring out what to do, and then we had cyber criminals who are probably the best example of ramping up in their capabilities because they're really, really good now. Uh, nation states were very slow to get on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, it took. Even though China was po poking around in 2003 during the Titan Rain uh, episodes, um, it took quite a while for them to really ramp up their capabilities. Russia is far, far behind China, but catching up extremely quickly. Um, but in a little tiny, any tiny country, like, I don't know, Iran, could easily become the experts in cyber attack scenarios. And when that happens, all the laggards that haven't paid any attention to this whatsoever are going to start to get whacked big time. And it's going to be horrible. And, but it's, I've also grown, being an optimist, I'm also uh, kind of a realist <laughs> in that none of us take any cyber defense stance or change our behavior until after we've been attacked and embarrassed in some way by it. Right? You don't turn on the two-factor authentication for your Twitter account until after it's been stolen and you've had to explain to everybody, hey, I'm sorry I spammed you for my Twitter account. I'm lame, I had my password guessed, right, in the five tries that Twitter gives you, and it was password. Um, same with your Gmail account. How many friends, you know, have to explain to you that their Gmail account was taken over and that wasn't really an email from them asking you to send them a check in, or a wire transfer money to them because they're in trouble in whatever country they're traveling in. Um, we, and it works for every organization. And don't get me started on retail. Right, I started writing about attacks on retail in 2004 when uh, Lowe's, which happened to be uh, local to me in Southfield, Michigan, 
Lowe suffered a drive-by Wi-Fi attack with a Pringles can. And, you know, they, they caught the guy, arrested him, all that good stuff. But then TJ Maxx, two and a half years later, suffered the exact same breach from the exact same methodology. And don't they read my blog? What's up with that? <laughs> so, so the strategy is pay attention. Forgive me. Please. I, I, I just have to ask, where does this optimism come from then? <laughs> Um, because I've seen the reactions. So there are a lot of lag times built in, but the optimism is that uh, if you want to protect yourself, if you understand the threat, I believe you can protect yourself. And I think you can even protect yourself and the industry will develop the tools and ability to protect ourselves from the greatest threat of all time, which is our own government, right? So you know, I've got this great chart of spending on IT security, right? And it's growing at about 34% every year for the last 13 years. Um, and the, the threats line up with that, right? So only as the threats grow does the spending grow. And I never, you know, I had information warfare as the highest possible threat. Couldn't be anything worse than that. I had no idea, like many in this room maybe, that an intelligence agency would be a bigger threat, right? That they would have $500 million budget just for hacking into systems and organizations. Uh, that is by far a bigger uh, threat actor than anything you could have conceived of, right? The Russians don't have budgets like that or the capability. And the industry is responding, right? We are going to get to the point where it will be too expensive for intelligence agencies to collect everything. They'll still be able to collect targeted stuff, right? They, you can't stop that, but they won't be able to collect everything. And most people, you know, will just fix the problem. Once we're exposed to it, we'll just fix it. And every, you know, we, we know how to stop a Stuxnet if we needed to. There's tools and technology out there to do it. And believe me, Iran's deploying them. And as a matter of fact, they probably come from Kaspersky because they just, shortly after Stuxnet, all of a sudden they ramp up this big uh, industrial control system security operations. I wonder why, who their customer is. So. That's why I'm optimistic. Besides, you know, I'm an analyst in this industry. That just makes me optimistic. <laughs> My industry's not going away. <laughs>